pleasure to introduce Kurt Kruger. Um, hi, Kurt. I guess we haven't met before. <laughs> um, so, uh, he, yeah, so um, Kurt is, is, is joining us. I'm not sure where you're sitting at the moment, Kurt, but... Um, I'm, I have the wonderful chance of being in Texas, where I currently live. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I guess it's probably not snowing there. It's snowing here in Hamilton. <laughs> um, so, um, here's the short bio there that uh, Ali has posted, um, but Kurt is an expert in agent-based modeling and I guess system dynamics and differential equations. That's the last paragraph. So um, perhaps uh, I'll just leave it like that. So Kurt, do you want to take over? Yes, happy to. Um, let me get my screen up. Assume that that has successfully shared. Looks Great. good. Um, okay, so um, thanks everyone for the for the the soapbox. I mean, the opportunity to speak. Um, and so uh, I'd like to spend a little time to just talk about uh, the work that we've been doing with the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Um, my background is with Dr. Osgood's lab at the University of Saskatchewan. So that's where I did my PhD um, from Saskatchewan, raised there, and moved down here for family reasons, but um, still maintain pretty strong connections to Saskatchewan. Um, and so I've been uh, uh, lucky enough to be part of an embedded ABM hybrid modeling team um, at the Saskatchewan Health Authority. So I'm just gonna talk about some of our experiences um, and how this may um, compare to some of my previous experience in more research-based um, work uh, in, in the academic space, as well as um, public health um, um, situations that you know, are not a pandemic. Um, so this may be a sort of, a, hopefully it's, a, it's some new learnings here that we can reflect on. Um, so yeah, I guess just to set the stage, um, I'm a consultant here in the U.S., but uh, embedded with the team in uh, Suggestion Health Authority, and so I'm, you know, most of my time is spent uh, working with them and working with people who are working at the Suggestion Health Authority, and uh, yeah, so that's that's the set, set the stage, I guess. Okay. So um, in the reflections of our team, uh, obviously the team has taken different shapes at different stages in the pandemic. Um, as we've reflected on sort of how do we increase our uh, value to the health authority and to the people of Saskatchewan, um, this, this comes from our senior medical information officer, Dr. Jenny Bezran. Um, we sort of broke it down into what we think is five key components or five key components to what an applied health system modeling would look like that's embedded within a healthcare system. Um, and really the main message that I'd like to communicate from this presentation is the value of I think as we move forward, maybe there's more appetite for this, really the value of taking systems modeling of different types and kind of integrating it as best as we can to within health organizations, health planning policy organizations, um, in some sense, perhaps alongside uh, the analytics teams that are already there. Um, so that's kind of uh, the model that we've been building for the last little while. Um, and so hopefully these five components are things that we can reflect on that might have value in advancing this uh, directive moving forward. So the first one here, um, one of the first key um, uh, key components is, the, um, is having a map of the full process. Um, obviously that's the model. Um, and when, when you have a model, the model should be representing kind of a map of the process uh, that's under scope. Um, and different stages, uh, you know, earlier on, maybe we didn't have a full model built. And so you would be supplementing with different types of maps. maps. But at the moment, this is what we have. So I'll spend some time talking about the map, talking about the model of the ABM. Bearing in mind the audience, maybe we'll spend a little more time on this section than uh, I would otherwise. Then we have the data. So obviously what's the data that we have access to? This is one of the areas where it's really valuable to be embedded within the health authority um, because certainly we have access to analysts and data that is not publicly available. So that can help us really increase the validity of the model. Um, obviously we'll, we'll have other sources of evidence as well. Um, and uh, so I'll be talking about data and evidence together. And then I think contextual knowledge is a really important factor um, as we build relationships with, within different uh, members, member groups uh, of a given health authority or health policy body. 
So I'll talk about that contextual knowledge, how we draw from that. And then last, but certainly not least, is the knowledge translation piece, um, which I think is a really important component that really requires a bi-directional relationship with the different stakeholders in the organization. Um, so the map, uh, or the model in this case, it was built in AnyLogic 8.7. Um, the first primary developer was Wade McDonald, who's here today. Um, and about a year, year and a half ago, I took over as the primary developer so that Wade could return back to his PhD studies. Um, so he's, he's a PhD student at Dr. Osgood's lab at the University of Saskatchewan. And a lot of his, um, a lot of his fingers can be seen in, in the model even to this day. Um, okay, so the model itself, it's an agent-based model um, that tries to, tries to characterize the complex geography of the province of Saskatchewan. Uh, it's an agent-based model with 1.2, approximately 1.2 million agents representing each person in the province of Saskatchewan. Um, and, you know, we're, we're not representing just a single city, but we try to capture all the cities and rural towns and communities within the province. So this is a snapshot on the right. This is a snapshot of the model itself. Um, the images that you see, the icons that you see here are some of the agents that we have represented. Um, so these are gonna be schools, hospitals, and long-term care facilities. Um, obviously not all 1.2 million people can be represented on this map. So they're not indicated there. But basically the, we have six main agents that um, have some kind of GIS representation within the province people, which would be the most important one. We'll spend some time on that. Um, hospitals, which I think is the second most important. And then long-term care, schools, um, households, workplaces. These are all relatively simple models that really, uh, agents, that really just give us the ability to kind of put a container on a map with the locations. There's not a lot of dynamics associated with them, so I won't touch on them today in the interest of time. And then we have some other agents that are not sort of GIS-based, um, so these are gatherings. I'll talk about what that means. We have COVID tests as a separate agent that undertakes the tests. We have contact tracing. Each of those have some dynamics that I'll talk about. Then we have variants and vaccines as well. So the model is able to track um, the spread of multiple simultaneous variants that have different interactions, uh, protection from, you know, if you're protect, if you're vac if you're infected from, previously infected from one variant, it'll confer some protection from the other variant, but not perfect protection. And also we have multiple vaccines. Now those ones, are, again, they're just, there's no dynamics associated with them. They're essentially just bundles of uh, parameters. So I won't spend too much time talking about them as agents, but I guess they will just come up in normal discussion. Um, and then finally, being that this is an any logic model, almost by definition, it's a continuous time model. Um, so that's, you know, for, for us modelers, that may be some uh, value. So I'll get into some of the structures of the person agent, which is the most complex agent. Um, and so I'll try to do sort of a high level sweep and hopefully there'll be some space at the end for some questions. So as with most of these models, it's built upon the backbone of an SEIR approach. So um, every, every person in the model has one of four possible infection states, susceptible, exposed, infective, and recovered. Uh, these transitions in any logic are just uh, bundles of logic that you say under what conditions somebody moves from one state to the next. Um, so this here, for example, is we can initially infect some people and they don't have to go through this um, development of, uh, of, of COVID. We can sort of treat them as cases that have been brought in. Um, but basically, most people will, will be susceptible in the beginning and then they'll receive a message from a, an agent in a similar geographic context that causes them to become exposed. And then after some period of time, they will transition to infective. Uh, and while they're infective, there's this little state transition here that basically um, causes that person to send a message to somebody in their geographic context to continue the spread. So this is where, this is where infection is being spread here. Um, and then after some period of time, they can recover and they can be reinfected or they can go back to susceptible over a period of time. Um, we separated the symptoms state chart previously symptoms was captured as a substate of infection, but we've brought this out so that people can be no longer infectious, but still experiencing symptoms. Um, so this is a separate state chart. And what this really tries to capture is the development um, of symptoms over time. So again, if you're susceptible and you don't have any, uh, if you're sort of COVID naive, then you'll be in this baseline COVID state. And then, um, 
If you become infected, you can enter this pre-symptomatic um, state, which means you're still asymptomatic, but you're on the way to developing symptoms. And then after a period of time, you can go from pre-symptomatic to either posse-symptomatic, which is really a combination of completely asymptomatic with, uh, and just having very mild symptoms, not clinically significant symptoms. And then uh, some people will be posse-symptomatic, but others will continue developing worse symptoms. So you can uh, upgrade sort of mild symptoms and some people will remain there and some people will then later on upgrade to severe symptoms. Some people will remain there and some people will upgrade to critical symptoms. And really the difference between severe and critical symptoms um, as it's currently envisioned in the model is that severe symptoms requires um, an acute bed at a hospital and critical symptoms requires an ICU bed at a hospital. And then um, we also envision that people with critical symptoms can step down back to severe symptoms before they end up going back to baseline after some period of time. And each of these transitions um, are, you know, we, we specify using parameters the model, um, and I'll talk about some of that data, but a lot of these are come from length of stay data that we have in Saskatchewan. Um, this is what we're calling the augmented protection state chart. So this initially was envisioned, envisioned to be the vaccine protection state chart, um, but especially based on Omicron, um, being able to do a lot of reinfecting. Um, we've really broken this out into something that's any kind of exposure whatsoever. So um, somebody's either naive or they have some level of protection. And that protection will come either through a vaccination or it will come through a natural exposure or some combination of those things. So basically everybody in the model starts off naive as they experience some exposure, natural infection or vaccination. Um, a period of a sort of an event will trigger at some point of time after that exposure, so maybe 21 days or 14 days later, depending on the, the nature of the exposure, um, they will develop protection. And then basically this set of choices um, allows the person to essentially sample from one of five unique protection states. Um, so rather than having, um, you know, the SEIR approach has the R as sort of a protection, protected or not Boolean, this allows us to break protection into five distinct levels of protection. So um, if somebody is all the way protected from infection, that means they could be you know, swimming in a literal vat of COVID particles and they won't get infected. Um, and then after some period of time, we have a waning, a waning transition here. They will lose protection from infection, but they'll still maintain protection from clinical disease or symptoms in our case. After a period of time, they can lose that protection, but they'll still maintain protection to hospitalization. And then the next one down is protection from death, or they can, they'll can they still go to the hospital, but they won't die in the hospital. And then the last one, if they lose that protection, then they'll go all the way down to unprotected. And so basically, um, every person who's exposed will sample from one of these five protection levels. And we specify kind of the probabilities of those samples, and we specify the rate of these um, of the waning of each of these steps. And then, um, so if somebody comes in with one exposure, then they'll sample from one of these and uh, then they may wane over time. And then if they get another exposure, again, it could be a vaccination or it could be a natural infection. It doesn't have to be the same as the first one. And they basically exit this state and they resample based on an additional exposure. So now this additional exposure will have a higher chance of putting them into the you know, protected from infection category higher up than they were before. And so by this way, we're sort of allowing multiple exposures to happen in, com in combination with waning. And the last point I'll mention, it's not visually represented here. This is a bit of a simplification. We effectively have this state chart for each of the different variants. So um, one could, in a sense, simultaneously be protected from infection against a wild type infection, a wild type of variant. Um, but only protected from hospitalization against a Delta type, for example. So we do have this captured for each of the different variants. Um, uh, so we do have behavior in the model as well. Um, people can be sort of in society mixing under their normal schedule. And um, yeah, if, they're, if they're not in hospital, but they're still sort of in society, they can be uh, put into self-isolation. So this would be, for example, if somebody's contact traced and then they found or tested and they're found to have COVID, they're asked to be in self-isolation. So a certain fraction of the population will then sort of go into the self-isolation state. 
We have a community cohort as well. Um, this is not something that we've been using over the last year and a half, but it's still there in the model. Um, we have uh, all the agents in the model. There's a public mask use compliance that's specified. And then each agent also has a risk tolerance where we try to capture some heterogeneity around the proposed difference in mask uptake for somebody who lives in an urban environment like Saskatoon or Regina versus a rural environment versus the Northern community in Saskatchewan. So we do try to capture that, um, adding a little heterogeneity there. And this last one is not strictly a characteristic of person, but it's a characteristic of cohorts of people. So I've added it here. Um, and we'll talk about gatherings. Uh, we'll talk about gatherings in a little bit, but gatherings basically um, allow people to gather outside of sort of work or home or those kind of uh, in those created structures, uh, those scheduled structures of their normal week. So we can have that as well. Uh, and that can vary over time based on uh, policy or, or, or behavior that we impose upon agents. Um, so we, the, all the agents, all the persons, the people in the model um, are associated with locations. And the reason why I'm saying associated is that they're not sort of actually in those locations. And this was really a decision um, that was made early on um, in order to improve the efficiency, a computational efficiency of the model. So if we have 1.2 million agents and they all have schedules and every day they're going between home and work and school and different locations on a map, that is really computationally expensive. And so instead of doing that, what we're essentially doing is um, giving people kind of a statistical distribution for their location, so for a given day. So rather than saying you're at work between the hours of nine and five and you're at home between the hours of five to midnight or whatever, we say a certain fraction of your day is at home, a fraction of your day is at work, a fraction of your day is at the hospital or so on. And so that means that we, it's kind of like on a computational side, it's kind of like a lazy evaluation. We're essentially not calculating where agents are if it's not epidemiologically valid. If, if there's no chance of spread, if somebody doesn't have, if they're in a community and there's no COVID, they're not, the agents are not moving around on the map. So we're not essentially polling them for where they are. So that allows us to run the model much more efficiently. But basically agents can, people can have an association with a number of different geographic contexts. So they can be in a certain region, as we showed before, Saskatoon and Regina, Moose Jaw, all the different small towns in the provinces are all captured. <clears throat> we even have hydrate colonies in the model. So they can have uh, an associated home region or work region. And those regions may not be the same, but they will be close to each other. Um, then we have households. There could be up to two workplaces. Some agents can work in more than one workplace. Um, we have schools, long-term care facilities, hospitals. And this, is, this would be if you're there, um, if you're there as a patient or as a, as a staff member, you could be there. Um, and then we also have the gathering. Obviously agents have uh, demographics, age and sex and where they live. Um, we do have a long COVID module in the model. This was built um, about a year ago as we were exploring um, some, some external stakeholders were interested in um, exploring long COVID. So we did build a long COVID component to the model. We haven't really been using it for the last year, but I imagine it will be something um, that we'll draw from in the near future. Um, and I can talk about that if we want, but maybe in the interest of time, I will step past it. Similarly, we do have flu in the model as well. So this, at some point in time, this was a question that uh, put to the modeling team to think about the, the, the flu season that we're currently, I guess, in or exiting. Um, obviously COVID happened, um, uh, Omicron happened, so that changed things. So we haven't uh, fully calibrated this component of the model, but it is in the model, it's running. <clears throat> And I think, again, this will probably be something that we, that we do in the coming months. So the next agent that I'll talk about is the hospital agent. And it's different from the person agent because it's basically um, entirely captured with a discrete event simulation. So the DES in my bio um, stands for discrete event simulation. Um, and so that's what's happening here. And so essentially what the discrete event simulation is is really useful when we're dealing with resource constrained process flows. Um, and so it's quite used regularly. It's used regularly for, for clinical settings, which is what we're having here. Um, and so basically the, the hospital itself has three zones. We have the ED, we have the acute or the non-ICU, and then we also have the ICU. And so basically the hospital, and again, there's something like 80 
if my memory serves me right, there's anyway, there's many tens of hospitals across the province. And um, as somebody who develops symptoms, COVID symptoms will present to uh, a hospital and they can enter the ED. And what the ED essentially allows them to do is to get tested. Um, so if they have mild symptoms, which means they don't need um, an acute bed in order to um, be cared for, they can be cared for at home, but it will provide an opportunity for them to get a test. <clears throat> and then for those individuals that have more severe symptom needs, they can be transferred into the acute or the non-ICU wards of the hospital. And in some sense, this is really where the rubber hits the road because as I maybe as modelers um, understand now, cases are not a really valid data point. Really what we're looking at is non-ICU uh, or acute admissions to the hospital. So this allows us to track those admissions, but it also allows us to convert from admissions to census. So the model is outputting the census over time based on the length of stay of an individual person, based on their age characteristics, severity of disease, and so on. <clears throat> and then for those individuals that require yet more higher levels of care, so they have a higher level of symptoms, a more severe level of symptoms, they can be transitioned into the ICU, which again gives us ICU admissions and ICU census. Now there's a few other, there's a few features here that are not um, really being used at the moment. They can be, they can be engaged and they were used at the past. So we did have um, some room to be able to deal with resource constraint in our clinical setting. Um, so we, we could ask how many people would be turned away at the hospital if uh, we had sort of, we're imposing resource constraint limits. A lot of our modeling has kind of sidestepped that for now. Um, so it remains to be seen, it remains to be seen if, we draw, if we'll draw from that in the future. Um, we also use discrete event simulation to capture the contact tracing process. And this is really important because at the least it introduces uh, delays from when a person develops symptoms to when they're tested, to when they're contact traced, to when they're notified and they can self-isolate. So um, we have contact tracing here. And again, we're, we're allowing the model to use a resource constrained approach, which we've used at the past. Um, earlier in the pandemic, we were really concerned with the contact tracing um, capacity of the province. That's kind of been eclipsed by Omicron, so we don't do that anymore, but it's still there in the model. Um, so this allows us to capture sort of when somebody is found, um, uh, when they test positive, either through presenting through hospital or through some other, met, uh, some other means, um, then a certain fraction of them will be contact traced. So they'll be, essentially they will enter this process flow and then um, there'll be some delays introduced and that person may be tested if they need to be tested or they will just, we will find the contacts of that person and then bring those, we may bring those people in for contact tracing or for testing as well. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in this architecture. And then for those people that test positive, we may uh, you know, request that they self-isolate, for example. And then um, we also have a testing agent, which is it's a very simple discrete event simulation. And again, this is primarily to introduce um, to introduce uh, maybe a backlog or to introduce delays between when somebody develops symptoms and goes for a test to when a test is actually reported to them. Um, so we basically have uh, a test, you know, entering here on the left. There may be some queue backlogs, so we can specify the number of tests that are able to be done per day, for example, and a backlog may form. Um, and then we can also introduce some delay in that in that um, process. And that delay from an epidemiologic perspective is quite important. So this was helpful to be able to build. Um, we have gatherings in the model. So um, after, I'll sort of just touch back a little bit uh, here. So there's basically two contexts where somebody would be spreading COVID. We would be having these physical locations, um, but then also we wanted to allow for um, spread kind of supplementary to those mixing environments, those GIS specified mixing environments. So what we created was sort of a little mathematical model where we essentially assume controlled but random mixing. So we can specify certain parameters for that gathering, how many people are in it, what's the density of it, how, how, how much are people mixing in it. Um, and and we, we've parameterized three separate types of gatherings. Um, so we have private social gatherings, public social gatherings, and then public non-social gatherings. So we've done our best estimates to specify sort of what would be the size of these gatherings and how many, um, how, 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 how would people mix within those gatherings and how frequent would be those gatherings and what would be the age distribution of people at those gatherings. Um, so this allows us to give sort of another supplementary um, space to spread COVID beyond just 
the home and the workplace. And um, because they're not necessarily uh, geographically specified, we're using a gravity matrix uh, because we recognize that people will mix between neighboring communities. Um, so we've in, 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 uh, we have a gravity model that allows people to um, mix with people in a neighboring community, but there's a very low chance that they'll mix with somebody, let's say, across the province. So that's what the sort of the gravity model allows us to calibrate. And this is really this is really a key a key one of the key levers that we pull for calibration of the model. There's a few submodels that we've built to support things. I'll just touch on them very briefly. Um, this is a separate little system dynamics model that we use to kind of map um, map the process of of uh, vaccine waning, of protection waning within a person. So we use this model to essentially um, translate from literature sources where they estimate the protection level over time against symptomatic infection or hospitalization for certain age groups. Um, and then we use this to kind of calibrate what would be the required parameters in the model to match that, um, that, that literature assumption. So we have this little submodel and then we have another submodel, which um, is, is uh, we're just beginning to use, which really helps us to try to um, estimate or fit a beta distribution around the length of stay so we can match empirical admissions data with empirical census and get some estimate for the length of stay so that the model can replicate, replicate what we think is the length of stay um, in the real world. Um, okay, so I'll now talk a little bit about data and evidence and um, Okay, we still have some time. So uh, this is one of the key areas where an embedded modeling team may have some advantages over um, a non-embedded modeling team. So uh, all I'm showing are publicly available um, slides, but I'll be sort of pointing to what the data would be behind that we have access to. Um, so here, um, this was uh, from a presentation, I guess, in mid-November. Um, this shows in Saskatchewan the total non-ICU admissions per day, um, and by you know for the entire province of Saskatchewan, and even by subregion. So we, you know, working with our digital health analytics team, we've um, kind of broken down the data to where people are from, not where they're admitted to, but where they're from, and we've broken the province down into kind of these four quadrants: Saskatoon, Regina, then the integrated north, and the integrated rural in the south. And so for each of those four quadrants. We can see the non-ICU admissions per day. We can see the non-ICU daily census. The same thing for ICU the admissions and then the census. So this is one um, central data source that we use to calibrate the model. We also have admissions by age group. So this is just looking again at admissions over time. For each of these different age groups, we can look at uh, where those admissions are coming from and what age um, is, is, are they're coming from. We have admissions by vaccine status. So some of this may not be read by the model, but we compare modeling results to some of these data sources um, to see if it fits our assumptions. You know, if the model is suggesting there's a surge when we didn't expect one, we can look at some of these data sources to see if that conceptually makes sense for us. So we have admissions by vaccine status as well. Um, this is generally not public. We have um, when somebody's admitted to the hospital, what was their to, did they get their first positive test on admission to the hospital or was it before admission to the hospital? And that gives us an understanding on how valid the, the case numbers are. Sometimes we'll see the model disagree with case numbers, but it'll agree with the admissions numbers. And so we try to use other different types of metrics to determine, does that make sense or is there a bug in the model that we need to address? Um, obviously vaccination is a big deal. So um, this was a snapshot that was shown to the public, but we have this over time. So you know, by each of these different zones and by each age group and by each dose and by date, we have the number of vaccines that are given. And the model can, we can essentially take that, um, obviously anonymize it and aggregate it and so on, and then allow the model to read it so that the model is vaccinating the aging population in a similar way to the real population. And then we can conduct our own analyses on the data as well. So internally, we conduct analyses on the relative risk of vaccination, this is shared as part of the entire package of modeling. So the communication from the modeling is not just the model, but it's also supplementary um, calculations and comparisons. And there's others that I didn't have um, publicly available things to show. We have estimates for length of stay. 
we have estimates for vaccine. We can conduct our own estimates for vaccine effectiveness and waning. Um, we often do jurisdictional comparisons between Saskatchewan and other provinces and other states in the US and other countries in the world. Um, earlier, especially, we had direct connection with the contact tracing um, the people so we could look at the number of contacts per case that they were finding on average, the number, what kind of delays they were seeing being introduced to the contact tracing uh, process. So all of these things can be used to sort of inform parameters in the model. Obviously, other things like wastewater, um, that's typically more publicly available. So we do have access to wastewater across the province as well. And roughly the way that we calibrate the model, this is maybe another difference to um, um, sort of um, um, research-based approaches or um, situations where we don't have a burdening pandemic upon us. Uh, we have to be pretty fast and nimble with our calibration. So we've kind of broken it down into two phases. The first phase is really estimating, um, you know, coming up with estimates for the contact rate for each age group within that population. Um, and this is where we, we look at a data, you know, we look at the data from September to November of 2020 when there weren't any policies in place. It was early in the pandemic. Um, there was a surge that happened in Saskatchewan. And so during that, we kind of assumed that that was kind of people's default pre-COVID behavior. And you know, we informed the model from our, our, our epidemiologic parameters, and then we made best guess estimates for these gatherings that I spoke about. And we really tried to manually calibrate what the contact rate by age group and by zone was to get the observed uh, cases and admissions data. Now, this really only needs to be repeated if you're, if you're taking a different assumption about epi parameters. Um, and so really, uh, most of the time we do this once or very rarely, we don't do it maybe more, we don't do it more than once a week. We do it maybe once a month or something where we have to go back. And the second phase is really just updating to the latest. So second phase is during COVID, uh, we've fixed the contact rate because that was what we assumed was the, the contact rate is the sort of non-COVID contact rate. And then we can modify it using interventions, but it's the baseline contact rate. It's essentially akin to assuming, uh, to, to estimating R naught of wild type. And then um, we have um, we can modify behavioral responses, and this would be in the in the simultaneously in the gatherings as well as um, maybe people working from home. There's other types of behaviors, sort of COVID-related behaviors that we can assume, and we vary those um, in, again in order to match. Primarily, what we're matching is admissions to hospital. Sometimes we're matching cases earlier on. We were matching cases, but now it's really just hospital admissions by age and by zone in the province. And really this only needs to be done um, to consider the last time since we've done it. So we, you know, our team is very agile. We're generating projections every week. Um, and so we, we're running these calibrations essentially constantly every week we're running them. Okay, so there's a couple more uh, uh, sections left and I'll try to be quick so we have time for questions. Um, as usual, I spend a little bit more time on the technical side than maybe I'd planned, but so the contextual knowledge, I think is really important. Um, really, really what we're talking about here is the relationships that are being built with other key stakeholders, operational leaders, clinical experts within the health authority. Um, and I think because you know, we, we are this embedded team, not only do we have um, the ability to do this, but I think the responsibility of really um, doing everything that we can to meet with these different groups. Um, and so really this allows us to, to share with them um, our understanding of the contextual, uh, our understanding of the process, as well as draw from their contextual knowledge. Um, you know, so these are some of the groups that we're meeting with. So we have sort of an oversight and a technical working group. We have epidemiologists, medical health officers, there's emergency operations. We have the ministry to the medical health officer. We have an executive leadership team. We have frontline teams. And we also obviously meet with external modeling experts, um, the PHAC external modeling experts group to double check our assumptions in the model. And you know, some of the assumptions that we've been challenged has been really valuable because, um, you know, for example, uh, people from, you know, when we're looking at um, uh, Saskatoon and Regina, they have, may have different clinical um, behaviors. And we also can be informed from these different groups that the people that end up being cared for in Saskatchewan or Saskatoon are typically gonna be either from Saskatoon or from the North. And people who are cared for in the rural communities, uh, people who are cared for in Regina, typically come more from the rural communities of Regina. So that, help, that helps us give context to interpreting the model results. Um, we also understand that 
you know, early in the modeling process, we saw we had a hard time getting the number of ignitions for the 60 plus age categories to match historic. And then meeting with these different teams informed us, well, many of the people from long-term care facilities have advanced care directives. And so they won't be going to the hospital, even if they would have the symptoms that would re require that. And we didn't have that mechanism in the model. So one should expect that the model would overestimate that age group. So it was really helpful to meet with these groups to give context to our understanding of the model. And really what that does is it helps, you know, improve the quality of the model. Um, that's one of its primary outcomes. Uh, the next outcome obviously is as we're improving the quality of the model and, and the stakeholders we're working with are seeing their knowledge being reflected in the model, it also builds confidence in the model itself. Um, and I think that's, you know, we wanna build useful models that get used. So the, you know, the, the stakeholders need to have the confidence that the model is reflecting the world in a useful way. Um, obviously, these gatherings also inform the direction of the model development. So um, should we add flu to the model or should we break down? Are we really concerned about schools? Should we add classrooms to schools? Uh, what are the types of directions that we should go in the development of the model? These, um, these gatherings sort of support that. And a really key one is they also help identify important modeling scenarios. So we as modelers can pull whatever levers we want, but if they're not the ones that people are caring about, or if they're not the ones that are uh, feasible, or if they're not the ones that are um, sensible, then uh, the stakeholders, it'll be hard for them to really value the contributions from the model. So we really want to make sure that the model is exploring the types of questions that our stakeholders are wanting to ask. And really, this process is bi-directional because we, we contribute to that as well. We, we inform um, our stakeholders the types of problems that are probably most efficient. And through this collaborative effort, um, we can kind of decide on what types of modeling scenarios are the most important to run and the most uh, appropriate to run. Um, and then the last one I'll speak about is knowledge translation. And uh, forgive me for not having left enough time for this. Um, but I think this is really, really important. I've learned from this project as well as others that, again, if you're gonna get, if you're gonna get buy-in from your stakeholders, this knowledge translation needs to be really um, considered. Um, an important part of knowledge translation, I think, is that it's bi-directional. Um, so, so, you know, the modeling team will present what we think is a good way of showing the results, of communicating the results. And we have different teams, like I was saying, that we communicate with. There's, there's a lot of back and forth. So we've had some tools where we built um, sort of interactive tools that allows different stakeholders to say, you know, what are the conditions that would allow the model to keep census under a thousand people, for example. Um, so, you know, we've done some exploring of that, different tables and graphs and diagrams. Um, so it's really important that this knowledge translation is considered as a bi-directional process um, so that everyone can kind of be kept on board. Um, and Really knowledge translation, I think, I mean, it's an educational process, both for the modelers, uh, I mean, both for the stakeholders, because they'll learn what modeling can and cannot answer, what types of questions modeling can and cannot answer. Um, and, you know, we had two primary stakeholders here. We had operations, um, and their primary concern was sort of the short-term forecast. How many people should we be um, planning to surge to? Um, should we be opening? Know, field hospitals or closing field hospitals? Where should we be moving resources? Should we be training nurses to be in the ICU or the non-ICU? Where's our burden going to be? So the nature of their questions was quite different. And so, you know, modeling helped them understand that the limitations of the model is that we can't treat the model, let's say, as a, uh, as a, as a magic eight ball to predict the future. We can really only tell um, possibilities of the future. So there was a, a really important learning curve there for our stakeholders. The other side is that we're dealing with policy, you know, sort of medium to longer term questions on public policy, masking policy and vaccination passports and um, you know, lockdown policies in the past and so on. Um, so again, a, a lot of conversation needs to be had that the projections made by the model are not set in stone. They, they often will not take place because the model doesn't have the requisite complexity to capture people's dynamic behavior as it changes over time. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, the stakeholders undergo quite, a, quite a, an important learning process with this knowledge translation. But I'd say also the modeling team has to learn that as well. So what, what questions are they trying to answer? What, what is the constraint of their decision-making? And how, so we then have to learn 
uh, the types of questions that they're having to make so that we as a modeling team can try to make the model um, fit that as much as possible. So that I think is a really important concept. And given that we're meeting sometimes every week and multiple times a week with these important teams, uh, really helps us sort of make sure our knowledge translation is, is, is up as possible. Um, there's a couple other pieces, but maybe we can stop. So this, this is one scenario, this is one example of something that we might show to an operation side where we say, we have these different scenarios and um, you know, at maybe two weeks from now, how many people should we expect to be, what, what should we expect to be a hospital census or an ICU ventilator census? This is an earlier one, more recent ones are a little bit more, uh, a little bit more rigorous. We have uncertainty intervals and stuff, but that's basically you know, some of the things that the operation needs to see. Um, we've also now broken this down by zone and region. Um, this, this, this is an earlier one, like I said. And then when we're speaking to a policy audience, we might have a graph like this where we, we look at kind of what if scenarios um, and you know, this would be like no change. And it's not just increasing mixing or decreasing mixing. We can have combinations of working from home or vaccination goals or masking goals or different types of, um, you know, of, of vaccine mandates. Um, for example. So all sorts of different types of things. And we, we spend a, a fair amount of work sort of um, modifying the results of the model, translating them into uh, sort of a nice crisp graph, let's see maybe a single image or a couple images that can be used by various stakeholders in communication with their, their the people in their spheres. Um, and the last slide here, um, sort of our, the key message of the summary is that ultimately, what we think needs to happen is that modeling needs to be integrated into the decision-making process itself. We need to be embedded within um, all teams, you know, in the same way that analytics is there perhaps. Um, and there's a few things that I think are really important to remember. So one is that the data and evidence is always evolving. So you need a process that can deal with that. Um, it's an iterative process as I hope I've communicated through um, the regular meetings that we have with different stakeholders. And that iterative process really is important for all those reasons I mentioned. Um, you know, the modeling can really help short and long-term thinking, but there's differences in how they work. The short versus long-term thinking is not necessarily the same kind of model that would result. Um, it's really important, and this is a hard thing for everyone to learn, models and uh, stakeholders alike, that we really need to learn how to embrace uncertainty when we're dealing with, um, you know, community, people's behavior, public health, and those types of things. Um, and I say the sort of fundamental linchpin that brings us all together is that through these collaborative relationships uh, that we build. And I think really that you can only do that if you're, an, if you're sort of an embedded part of the organization. That building those collaborative relationships, you build trust. I think that makes a difference between a useful model and a useful model that gets used. Um, so I didn't give enough time for uh, questions. This is, this is my last slide um, and I'll stop here. Hopefully, hopefully that's of value for people. I think Tom, you're muted. Tom, you are in mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, Kurt. Um, so there's a Q&A um, button on the bottom of your Zoom screen, and there's a couple of questions. There's one question there from Martin. Do you want to ask? Do you want to come live, Martin, and ask it in person? I should. I should provide him with access if, if that's the case, but- uh, Okay, I think, I think that's a fairly good question. Um, I, I, can, I can answer that. So um, the question is around how we're capturing the difference between PCR and rapid antigen tests. Um, so that is a limitation of the model. We don't have rapid antigen tests in the model. So we really only have the PCR test. And that's one reason why um, cases is becoming a much, weakened value, it's a, it's a, it's a weakened um, data source during Omicron um, because the province has transitioned away from a lot of PCR testing. And you know, I know in other districts in, in, the, in Australia, in some districts in Australia, for example, they have a way of reporting rapid, rapid antigen tests. We don't have that in the model, so in, in Saskatchewan. There's no real way of reporting the rapid antigen tests that people are taking in their homes. Um, and so we just haven't gone through the work to add that to the model because it would add it introduced a lot of uncertainty that we're not able to calibrate. Um, so we're not really assuming rapid antigen tests. There's no, none of those exist in the model at present. Uh, 
Um, if if there's uh, no question from the audience, uh, I, I would like to ask a couple of questions. Uh, Kurt. Uh, Sorry, I I was muted there and I said something that nobody heard. Um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so I see one hand is raised from Ellen. Hi, thanks, Kurt. What a great uh, presentation. I had a, a quick question about the last thing you, well, one of the last things you talked about in, about embracing uncertainty and how you, if, if you were able to get people to embrace an uncertainty and, and what were some of the methods that you used around that? Because I think that's a big question in, in my <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought it up. I agree with you. I'd say that our biggest tool in embracing uncertainty was COVID itself. So <laughs> I think, I think, uh, I think it's been, it's been a, a, a two years of the world learning what uncertainty really means. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think a lot of embracing uncertainty is really comes out when, we, when we're meeting with teams and we're sort of undergoing um, critical analysis of the modeling results. So let's say, for example, that this, this happened on multiple occasions. The modeling is presented to various stakeholders and it suggests a massive surge is coming. Um, and nobody believes it because we've never seen it before. Even the modelers are like, ah, is this real? I don't know. Yeah. And so you know, the modeling is presented there and then it's an opportunity for everyone to really ask questions like, um, you know, everyone is reading about Omicron uh, and, and COVID a lot. So they have so all sorts of assumptions around what's going on. And, uh, it's, it's going to be a problem because of this, or it's not going to be a problem because of this. Are you capturing the right age group? Is waning appropriate? Are you dealing with mixing in schools? There's a lot of cases, but if it's kids, or is that going to show up in the, you know, is that going to show up? But they have all sorts of questions, and it really gives the team an opportunity to critically explore the model and the modeling team an opportunity to really update the veracity or the validity of the model. Um, and so I think, I, I think like, once we can kind of identify the modeling team also when we're showing the results are communicating what are the big assumptions that we're making that our, our results are sensitive to, right? So obviously one of the big ones um, is the assumptions on waning, like the, the, the speed of waning of vaccines and then the, the peak protection of those things that gets different stages. So um, when we're meeting with the teams, they'll give us like what scenarios they're interested in learning about. Um, but it's our responsibility as a modeling team to run many more scenarios than just that. We don't run just the five scenarios they want to know about, because we also have to, we have to do exploratory analysis to figure out what parameters are really sensitive, what different combinations of parameters will lead to increases or decreases. So it's really on, on our job to run that. And as we're developing this relationship with these various stakeholders, they they see the logic of what, we're under, of what we're understanding and they see the uncertainty of, of estimating waning or, or, or vaccine protection or mixing or so on. Um, and oftentimes we'll also point them to data that would be nice if we had, but we don't have. So we don't have rat test results, for example. We don't have mobile phone contact tracing or mobile phone uh, mixing measurements. There's a lot of things that we could have, but we don't have. And I think that really helps people understand the inherent complexity of the situation. Once we get that complexity, I think uncertainty comes out. It doesn't make people feel good. Nobody wants to be dealing with this level of uncertainty. Um, but I think, you know, that's a capacity that's built, which is whenever we're showing the results of the model, we don't say, we're expecting a surge to 1,000 in the center. We don't say that. We say, well, it's going to go higher. It's going to go lower. Um, uh, you know, the, the number itself is not the thing to consider. It's so I think a lot of that really just comes from building that relationship over, over years in this case. Great, thank uh, you. But that's just our own experience. I'm sure there's better ways to do it. Okay, thank you. So a couple of uh, panelists have their hands up. I think uh, Ali, you got there first. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Kurt, for what, this great uh, presentation. And um, I have some questions, but I just uh, go with one of them. That is basically based on your experience in this case, which is really amazing, putting together so many different angles of modeling, simulation, visualization together. Based on your experience, uh, how, what was the impact of using uh, agent-based modeling uh, in this particular context versus, for example, other possibilities, other modeling possibilities? Uh, and in particular, using, for example, uh, 
any logic as a platform, uh, what kind of impacts that or difference that made in terms of connections, working with the team decision makers uh, uh, on the ground, uh, their feelings, their experiences, et cetera. That's, that's my question. I hope I was clear about that. Um, so earlier in the stage, we did have Dr. Osgood and his lab at the University of Saskatchewan were the sort of primary modeling support that uh, the health authority relied on and for a long time they did. Um, and so there's a lot of modeling I didn't talk about. So his lab developed a system dynamics model that was used initially because it takes a little bit more time to build a solid ABM than an SD model. And so we had a Venson SD model that we were using for very, very initial planning. Um, and um, that I think was, was really valuable because we got it out the gate. I mean, Nate and his lab got it out the gate very quickly. And we also had another model that was supporting, really agent-based modeling is, is not, its main uh, value is not in the short-term projections, but in sort of the longer-term scenario planning, what if questions. Um, and so there was another model for some time that was being used again from Dr. Osgood's lab um, called a particle filter. So it was an SD particle filter combination. And that's really helpful for, you know, taking wastewater into account and case data into account, test positivity into account and generating kind of shorter term projections um, and uncertainty. So multiple different types of modeling were used. And I think a mature modeling group would draw from multiple different modeling approaches. The advantages of any logic is that it allows you to use a lot of these in one modeling package. So you, as you've seen, this is a hybrid model. I don't really know how I would build this in another, another tool um, that allows me to do ABM and discrete event simulation. And then also those supplementary models for system dynamics uh, models. Um, so for that type of modeling, any logic is a pretty useful tool. Um, but again, it's not able to do everything as well. So the particle filtering uh, SD model that you can do in any logic and you can do in other packages as well. Um, you may have to sort of do that in C to, to keep it um, efficient. But again, that's, that's work that's done on Nate's side. Um, and I'll mention just one more point. I think, actually, I'll stop right there because we only have a few more minutes. So um, I'm happy to talk with you offline about this as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so Michael, you've got your hand up. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good talk. Um, I'm interested in the fact, you know, building, I guess, on the last question, that within the NA logic model you presented, there's a mixture of agent-based, I guess, for the person, discrete event for the hospital, and then uh, system dynamics for uh, waning, I think it was. So uh, what was, the, you know, when you thought about it, well, one question is, when you use discrete event, what exactly do you mean? Because I would think that if the agent-based model is in continuous time, it can also be thought of as a discrete event uh, thing. You know, a person gets infected or they meet somebody. So what is the, the meaning of discrete event? And what are the pros and cons of being able to mix in within this single any logic uh, code, these different kinds of uh, uh, frameworks or ways of, spe more formally, I guess, the ways of specifying uh, that component of the model. Thank you for the question. I think that's, uh, you've touched on something which I think is, a, I think is sometimes a, it's a poor definition of terms. So I, I say discrete event simulation because DES is a term that's being used in the industry, but it's not really an appropriate name. It should be called process centric modeling. So really the discrete event package within any logic is about modeling processes and, and its, its real value is modeling um, resource constrained processes. So basically you have, um, I guess I'll go to the contact tracing. So you can have entities, they don't have to be full agents, but they move through this process. And it's, you know, you, you could do all of this in an agent-based model if you want, but you'd have to be building a lot of custom code. It wouldn't be necessarily very efficient. It's not visually very appealing. Um, and so this allows us to very quickly build the basic notion of any kind of a process. And that it could be individuals moving through a process. It could be tests moving through a process. It could be um, other types of abstract characteristics uh, moving through a process. So the process, when we say discrete event, that's kind of what we're after. Any logic scheduling underly underlying schedule is it's a, a, an event-driven model. So when I say continuous time, it's different. It's again, it's some terms we have to. I think the modeling industry needs to 
needs to iron out. Continuous time is different than continuous time in this uh, system dynamics model. Um, so many agent-based models have, you know, net logo models, for example, they have what's called this tick. So every day there's an event that happens and everyone kind of updates their, their state based on what happened in that day. Um, and in any logic, however, when we specify, when, when we have a, a state transition, we can specify that this transition from, you know, one state to another state happens at any moment in time. It doesn't have to happen on the day. It can happen 2.653 days later, for example. So that when we say continuous time, that's what we mean. But underlying, you're right, it's an event approach. It's an event queue, and we schedule all these events that take place. The underlying mechanism is this event, but functionally when we're using it, we think about it as continuous time. So I don't know if that helps, but that those terms I've always felt uncomfortable with, and I'm glad you touched on that. Thanks. And the system dynamics part, uh, how tightly integrated is it with the um, other two parts? So the system dynamics part here, I've done models in the past where you put system dynamics models within agents themselves. And so it's sort of fully integrated. You can do that in any logic. This system dynamics model, it's a separate model. It's not, you know, I, I sort of have three separate models and this is one separate model and I'm just using it for calibrating the parameters. Um, the way that's captured in the agent is through, is through uh, this state chart here. So this, again, it's a discrete state um, state chart and, and, and that system dynamics model, it's a separate package. So it's not a hybrid model. This is only hybrid for ABM and that process centric DES. Okay, thanks. Pleasure. Okay, thanks. Um, so Jian Hong had his hand up, but now it's taken it down. Maybe no, I think Elizabeth has some excellent questions. So uh, I think Elizabeth should have her first and I might be able to follow up with this question actually. Oh, okay, Elizabeth, do you wanna go? Sure. Um, yeah, so I was just kind of wondering, you mentioned adding flu into the model. And so I want to know kind of how you were planning on adding that in. So is it gonna be sort of as a separate disease model that kind of runs in parallel or is, it, is there gonna be sort of an interaction between flu and COVID where someone who um, is maybe infected with the flu is more susceptible to COVID or vice versa? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, many of those questions I don't know the answer to. So we built the structure for the flu. And before we really got to go through the validation process, we got hit with Omicron. So we abandoned that immediately and moved on to other greener pastures, let's say. Um, but um, basically, they're, these are separate. These, within the agent themselves, they're separately captured state charts. And so we can essentially posit whatever interaction we want. Um, I just showed this because the modeling structure is there. But again, the thinking through that needs to be considered. Um, and this differs from how I'm capturing variants in the model. So variants are captured uh, in, a, in a way where you can't be co-infected. You can't have alpha and delta at the same time, but you can have one of the variants of COVID and flu at the same time. And we haven't thought around sort of what the confounding, uh, increasing severity of that would be, but certainly, um, you know, since we have uh, multiple different symptom state charts, we can come up with some combination of those. But the epidemiology, we haven't thought through. The, the modeling structure is present. Thanks. Yeah, thank maybe, you. Maybe, Kurt, I can follow up this question. Uh, I read really like the question. Um, I feel uh, if, if testing capacity is included, is considered, if absentee is an issue, for example, then actually there will be complication due to the flu because they share the same symptoms and they might increasing the burden for testing. They might also increasing the socioeconomic uh, consequence such as the absentee. So those are things are um, uh, not really co-infection, but it is relevant to co-circulation of two symptom disease with similar symptoms. Yes, yeah, I, I fully agree with you. And, and clearly one of the limitations for this, for example, is that every admission in the model is due to COVID. We don't have admissions to hospital due to broken legs or stab wounds or car accidents or cancer or anything like that. Um, and so, you know, we e even the numbers that come from the model for admissions, as soon as we add flu, now we have multiple reasons to come in. You have confounding symptoms. You have to reason between those. You have limited testing capacity for all of those things. 
So yeah, that's another thing that will come that we'll really have to you know get our teeth into when we want to explore you know expand the model really into the fluid component. But yeah, I fully agree with you. It's very complex. Great. Um, so there are no hands raised at the moment, which suggests that 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 we might be um, moving towards the end of the Q and A. Um, does anybody want to have the last question? Raise your hand. I see one question in the chat, Martin Brunel, event driven as opposed to time step. Uh, yeah, it's event driven as opposed to time step. We don't have a fixed time step in uh, any logic models. Right. Yeah, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I don't see any more questions. So, as um, the host, maybe I should collectively, um, yeah, point out that in the um, raise hand, lower hand. Yeah. So um, there is a. a uh, I'm raising my hand and lowering my hand. I was looking for the clap. <laughs> okay. I can't. But it's, I've lost the clap icon, but maybe we can all have a round of applause for Kurt. He's a masterful job of presenting a complicated model. Thank you. It's, I it's learned been, a lot. It's been an interesting um, period of time for sure. Yeah. So, oh, Elizabeth posted a QA. and a Okay, I didn't see that. Um, but okay, well, um, perhaps we should wind up and, uh, and wish everybody a happy weekend. Yes, thank, thank you very much. much. And see you in two weeks uh, when we have uh, Professor Nathaniel Osbitt from University of Saskatchewan. Indeed. The okay. master, some of us say. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Kurt. Thank you, Ali, for setting it all up. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>